hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences in different parts of the world. Welcome to the SNS webinar. The speaker for the session today is our honorable guest from India, Professor Suchandra Patachadi. Uh, professor Suchandra is an additional professor uh, at the Nizam Institute of Medical Sciences, Hyderabad. And her clinical interests are focused upon pediatric neurosurgery, and she also heads the epilepsy surgery program at the Institute. She has several publications in various peer review journals, and she also an invited faculty to several conferences conducted around the world. We are extremely honored to have her today at our webinar, and she'll be talking about surgery of several AVMs. The speaker for the second session today is our honored guest uh, from Brazil, Professor Ricardo Fosenta. Professor Fonsenska is a professor in, at the University Hospital, Federal University, Vale do San Francisco Refit. And he's a member of Brazilian Society of Neurosurgery and Brazilian Academy of Neurosurgery. He organizes uh, basic training courses in transcranial Doppler at University of uh, uh, Buenos Aires, uh, Argentina. He completed his internship in neurosurgery and Brigham and Women Hospital, Harvard Medical uh, School, uh, Boston, Massachusetts, uh, United States of America, and visiting fellows in pediatric neurosurgery at Danau Children Hospital, Sorosky Medical Center, Tel Aviv, Israel. Uh, and his clinical uh, interests are focused in the management of cerebral vascular diseases, central nervous system tumors, pediatric neurosurgery, spine pathologies, traumatic brain injury, and transcranial Doppler. We are extremely honored to have him today at our okay. webinar, and today he'll be talking about supraorbital keyhole approaches for vascular and non-vascular pathologies. Ben, may you continue? Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. So the chair for the first session of today's webinar is our own uh, guest from uh, India, Professor Matthew Abram. Professor Matthew is a consultant neurosurgeon at the Nisi Hospital, Kochi, India. He was the former head of the Department of Neurosurgery at the Sri Shita Tiruno Institute of uh, Medical Science and Technology, Kerala, India. His clinical interests are focused upon several vascular neurosurgery and epilepsy surgery. He is trained and mentored several neurosurgeons across the country, and he is a noted author and narrator who is an invited faculty to several conferences around the world. We are extremely grateful for, uh, to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of, the, of uh, Professor Susanna. The chair for the second session of today's webinar is our honorable guest from Lviv, Professor Casper Osnens. Professor Osnens is an associate professor in the Department of Neurology and Neurosurgery at the Rikers Stratton University's Rikers Lviv. He is also a, a member of the EANS. He is one of the faculties for the EANS Young Neurosurgeon courses. He did his fellowship from the Royal Melbourne Hospital at Hels and at Helsinki under Professor Chua. We are extremely grateful for him uh, to ask, for accepting our invitation for ch to chair the first session for today's uh, webinar. On behalf of the Education Committee of ACNS and the President, Professor Yokato, I would like to welcome both the speakers and the chairs and the audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. A very warm welcome to our colleagues in China, and we are extremely thankful to Professor Xu Bin for broadcasting uh, this in the, uh, on the we WeChat channel. And also uh, and also alongside with me, uh, Dr. Liu from uh, Malaysia, who, who will be the co-host uh, for today. So with that in introduction, I would like to hand over this online podium uh, to our first chair. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce the topic as well as the speaker, Dr. Suchanda. Uh, the topic of surgery for avians is so dear to me. And uh, I must say, Sujanda is an ideal person to give this talk. Um, if you see, AVMs are a combination of intraaxial surgery as well as vascular surgery. It, in the initial stages, an AVM surgery may look like it's a very delicate, refined surgery, and suddenly it will look like a gladiatorial exercise. So, AVM, operating AVMs is actually a, a collection of skills which is not very commonly used. Uh, in neurosurgery. And these two are two at a very high, highly refined level. I must say with a vast experience of epilepsy surgery and as well as vascular surgery, Sujinda would be an ideal person to give 
a talk on uh, avms over to you sukanta uh, good evening everyone my disclosure i am down with flu so uh, tolerate my froggy voice today and uh, it's uh, i'm a bit nervous i think to present in front of uh, professor matthews because he's my mentor for epilepsy surgery and and i know my skills for avm comes only after doing an epilepsy surgery and the confidence builds up with doing such complicated cases and professor matthew actually played a great role in mentoring me for epilepsy surgery so with this and uh, i would like to uh, speak on uh, strategies to manage arteriovenous malformation so we all know a little bit about arteriovenous malformation or a developmental anomaly of the vascular system it consists of tangles of poorly formed blood vessels in which the feeding arteries are directly connected to a venous drainage network without any interposed capillary system the presentations are not very great they are usually the similar types either it is an intracerebral hemorrhage or a schiza or a focal neurological deficit confined to the anatomical area or or unless reported for avms so what's the natural the rupture rate of avm is between Two point one per patient. If there is already an hemorrhage, we know that the risk of re-hemorrhage is escalates to six percent for the first year, and the risk of serious morbidity, morbidity, and mortality after hemorrhage is thirty to thirty five percent. Mortality rate after the first, second, and third hemorrhage are approximately ten, fifteen, and twenty percent respectively. So you know that this is a serious disease. So the conventional classification to guide treatment is the classic Spezzler-Martin grade, which was given in 1986, which uh, where you have the size, the eloquence, and the pattern, and you follow this now, and then, then subsequently realize that that this is not sufficient for grade three. So uh, grade three has been further classified by law. patient as a b c d and this is the picture pictorial way of how a grade 1 or a b c d defines and grade 3 are the tricky ones so what decision making how do you do whenever an avm comes there are few things which comes to our mind whether it is a ruptured avm whether it is symptomatic unruptured avm whether it is an unruptured avm but there is significant risk factors whether it's in the eloquent cortex and of course the grade of the avm then the special situations like pregnancy where if they have avm they tend to rupture or in pediatrics <clears throat> so now let's uh, take the example of this case peer male presented the schizer s and grade 1 came with a bleed not a very eloquent area so anyway all areas in the brain i consider to be eloquent but this is not a classical eloquent area so this is good for embolization and of course good for surgery surgery gives the best result if you can do it and so they had for surgery this so straight forward case no worries patient went fine now let us consider the thalamic avm with a rupture and this is a thalamic avm with rupture Uh, yeah that was also a rupture case and what do you do in this case probably this case goes for radio surgery and uh, you know that operating there it's difficult the best the best option what we can offer probably is radio surgery in this case so if you look at the treatment it is either surgery or endovascular or stereotactic radio surgery or gamma knife radio surgery but now we have a uh, multi modality where you can use combination of surgery or endovascular or srs <clears throat> historically what do we know grade 1 and 2 we go for surgery grade 3 we have multi modality treatment grade 4 and 5 no treatment but now grade 4 and 5 we don't say no treatment there are various treatments which has evolved for grade 4 and 5 also and people experienced people are attempting to treatment So let me talk about grade four and five little bit. Patients with high grade AVM usually have three management options. One is observation, which most of 
the people follow stage temporalization plus microsurgical resection stage temporalization of large avms with high blood flow and cerebral still what happens they occlude the large feeding arteries in different vascular territories and redirects blood flow to this or auto regulated arteries in adjacent brain in a stepwise manner rather than all at once during surgery or volume shrinking stereotactic radio surgery or volume shrinking stereotactic radio surgery followed by micro surgery so these are the things which has evolved over the years for grade 4 and grade 5 so if you look at the micro surgical avm resection after acs there are some helpful tips or factors you can say what does a radiation do? Radiation induces biological changes that facilitate resection. It causes intimate hypoplasia and medial hyalinization and thickens the arterial wall. It narrows the lumens and occludes the feeding arteries. The components of the nidus may obliterate and shrink its active volume. Blood flow through the AVM is reduced. Sclerotic arteries are easier to coagulate. Surrounding gly gliosis creates favorable dissection planes. Perforating arteries that supply the deep borders near the white tracts are transformed from thin and friable to thick and coagulable, coagulable, and diffuse margins can be obliterated by radiation. So when you give radiation and then you go for surgery, these are your positive factors. Now, if you look at this study, you can see that uh, after VSSRS, when they did, the cure was out of 58 cases, cure was in eight, and when they did with surgery, cure was in 15 of the cases. So this, this looks a pretty good uh, statistics, and this has been published from uh, Mr. Abayata. So what does the trial say? What we know about AVM is the classical Aruba trial. In Aruba trial, it was the largest multi-center randomized trial, but it was abandoned in between because of the following criticisms. There was a lack of standardization of the treatment arm in which very few patients with surgically amenable lesions underwent resection. There was a short follow-up duration, an excessively high hemorrhage rate in the intervention group, a lack of data regarding AVM obliteration rates in the intervention group, and a lack of treatment completion in the intervention group, in which more than half of the patients had either not completed or initiated therapy at the time of data analysis. So it has to be abandoned. It did not give any conclusion. The conclusions were not uh, very user-friendly. So they came up with the, another trial, and that is the Tobas trial, which is the treatment of brain AVM study. And this study addressed the crucial question of conservative versus interventional management and uh, for AVM judge appropriate for other, either management paradigm and role of adjunct embolization in patients with ruptured or unruptured AVMs treated with surgery or radio surgery. So this was the design, whether you do embolization surgery or radiation, and then finally embolization, no embolization surgery or radio surgery. Very, very, it's very recently that uh, the surgical results are out. And then if you see that in this study, 152 underwent surgery of 1,010 patients and 128 were ruptured and 28 were unruptured. And they were in grade one and two and 78 had embolization prior to surgery and the surgical angiographic cure was obtained in 89%. But 105 were low grade, mean follow-up of 18 months. But the interesting fact in this study is that permanent treatment related complications leading to MRS score more than two occurred in six patients. And of the six patients, five had complications due to preoperative embolization. So this is something which we need to consider. So microsurgery as an option, why? Because if you look from this study, though it was a little older study and the embolization radio surgery rates with the newer techniques have gone up, but still, if you see surgery has the best result, radio surgery and embolization, they, now they are claiming up to almost 70. And in grade one and two, they are also claiming up to 80, but then that was in 2011. And I will tell you now what are the advances advances in surgical resection of AVMs. Why we are taking more and more surgery? Because now we do cranio awake craniotomy. We have ICG videography. We have NGO suit now for surgery where we can both do 
embolization as well as surgery at the same time. Non-stick bipolar helps tremendously neuro navigation, augmented reality, intraoperative MRI, as post of check neuro ICU post of care protocols, which have also evolved over a period of time. So all this has led to a favorable outcome. Embolization, if you look at it, of cerebral AVMs are used as adjunct before open surgery or radio surgery for cure as a standalone treatment to target the weak NG architectural points and palliative purpose. Now, if you look at curative embolization, the AVMs with this sort of characteristics like less prominent angiogenic nidus or a fistulous AVM or single or less than two feeders with deep and central location and large size of feeding artery. So what are the advantages of embolization? Minimal invasive, in immediate angiographic evaluation, uh, even after the treatment or immediate occlusive effect, the criteria could only be applicable in 30 to 40% of AVM. Nidus and veins also of the AVM should be embolized, small AVM, few arterial feeders, more than 80% and medium size AVM, stage embolization or some pressure cooker technique. I'll not go into the details because I don't have an experience of uh, endovascular things. So disadvantage is very selective indication. Patients with ruptured AVM presence with imaging or clinically relevant findings of brain damage and that obscures the post embolization DWI or clinical evaluation. Hemorrhagic events during or after AVM embolization are the worst complication and are associated with a high rate of morbidity and mortality. So this is a case now waiting with me in OPD and probably this is a case with a huge venous dilatation and an ideas. Probably this is a case where we can go for a, this is done uh, for, a, and, uh, for an endovascular option. We can also do a surgery, but maybe endovascular we do and then go for surgery. Either can be done. So why radio surgery? If you look at it, microsurgery in eloquent region is associated with significant morbidity. Hence, their radio surgery stands a good option, even though it has its disadvantage. Embolization again is associated with high morbidity, and morbidity with radio surgery is relatively low, and mortality is rare. So radio surgery. So now let us look at this particular one. Obviously, we cannot attack it with surgery and embolization is also not good. And then you can see with radio surgery, but it takes a long time. It took seven to 10 years to come to this part. Post GKRS, this, but they have to be lucky to sustain no bleeding during the waiting period. This is one of our case after one year there is a shrinkage, but then all the time while they are waiting, there is always the chance of bleeding. <coughs> but yes, for eloquent areas, when we don't have other techniques, probably this is the best option at hand. So if you look at the latest studies from 2017, now they are talking about 78.3% at 10 years obliteration rate. So now let us look at this case. This patient presented with multiple episodes of uh, multiple episodes of left focal scissor when no deficit. So he came to us because thinking that he has an epilepsy. So obviously we did a CT scan, we could see something there. And then we did an MRI, we saw that there were almost two, there is one AVM here, you can see there is another AVM here. So we were not very sure whether it was an AVM, cavernoma or something, but we were, yeah, but it's very different. You don't get like uh, almost a mirror AVMs on both the sides, but nevertheless, we investigated. And then this, you can see this almost on the same side. Why I call it a, a mirror AVM? Because if you see the CT NGO or the DSA, you can see it's, it is splitting from the MCA, the same branch on both the sides of both the uh, right and the left side. So we are we we deal with mirror avians quite a few, but to deal with mirror avians, mirror aneurysms quite a few, but to deal with mirror avians, it's a rare situation. And you can see large venous dilatations. So what do we do now? It's a eight year old boy and going to school, otherwise fine having seizure, whether you wait, whether you do surgery, embolization or radiation. 
we talk to the parents and of course uh, radiation is a no no cons considering the cognitive things and he has a long life ahead embolization yes you can do embolization and go for surgery but then i think we we felt that surgery was the best option and we'll do a stage surgery now the problem is that once you do surgery of one side because of the cerebrovascular dynamics the other side is at the risk of rupture so you have to do that also very soon so we planned for surgery since he was having a focal schism on the right side we planned to do the a left avm first and then we planned to take up the right side on the uh, after 6 months so this was how the avm looked and this was on opening the dura it was a massive one and it was a scary one as all avms are and this is the nidus and i will just show you the video of this case because it was a difficult one in the sense that uh, the dura was very much attached to the venous legs so you know your heart starts pounding when you open and when you know that you are to handle the uh, veins at the end of the surgery in avm but uh, here when it is attached so this one but the trick for all avm surgeries are i think that you have to be very patient and you have to go step by step if you have indigo cyanine at your hand it's helpful to identify the arteries or otherwise the usual technique of going side by side circumferentially and then going deep and clipping all the arteries which comes on your way and then Uh, after dissecting is completely and then use this ligar clips and then you cut and then finally finally the last is you cut from the venous connection so this is uh, this was how this surgery was done and i think it's a pretty much uh, uh, standardized technique of doing this and uh, we did not have any problem in the post op and the child did well so we planned we were we told them we met, we had a very uh, good post op care with a good bp control and all but all the time we were worried that the second the other side avm might bleed now but and then came the covid and so instead of 6 months we had uh, to wait for one year and then we took up the surgery now this was a smaller one but this was the difficult one to do because it was not surfacing and then you can see that this is the arterialized vein and this is the normal vein and we know that the avm was here so we had to preserve this vein because it looks pretty big and it must be of significance and this is the arterialized veins so it was a difficult surgery compared to the previous one but as usual if we follow the principles which were laid down by our seniors and uh, the masters in cerebrovascular surgery of going slowly circumferentially identifying the arteries clipping them and then slowly slowly taking one artery after the other i think it's pretty much the same i'll move forward little bit and uh, then taking off one of the the artery here if you can see i am trying to preserve the whole vein the normal vein i was very careful of not disturbing this normal vein and uh, trying to work underneath it and uh, because uh, you, if you disturb the normal vein obviously you have your implications and we all know what a venous infarct are so i mean it's pretty much the same technique of you go around and take arteries and then finally you take the artery and find so here also the surgery went peacefully and the patient did fine i'll show you the implications of icg this was pre excision of the second case yes and and this is the post excision where you can see that the vessels are not being the arterialized veins are not being seen 
and this was the post stop after the second surgery both the sides and the child is doing well after one year now and going to school without any cognitive deficit now this is another case of a 20 year old male who presented uh, with paraparesis for two months along with bilateral grip weakness had a neck pain and syncope was the presentation he was he did have a vp shunt at some other hospital five years back for hydrocephalus then also presented with the same way and then he had a spastic, spastic paraparesis of this one of grade four and then you can see there was a cervical avm and uh, this was a glomus type of avm and we decided seeing the condition of the boy we decided that he requires it this was the pre-op dsa we can see and we decided to operate upon them and this was the surgery i will show that uh, yeah, so all these cases we can do now with the help of ICG because they show you the arteries and of course they're tricky, but the patient already had, probably if the patient would not have any paraparesis, I might not have dared to take up this case. But since the patient was roaming around for five years and having a paraparesis and after studying the uh, NGO, I felt that this was doable. So we went ahead and we took up this case and we identified the uh, vessels, the radicular ones, which came. Uh, it was the radicular artery which was coming and supplying. And uh, you need to identify them. And yeah, once we identify the usual technique of uh, putting a clip and subsequently identify the rest. And then I'll just go through because, yes. Once you do that, you go in the glytic plane and slowly, slowly you shrink them. And in between, yes, I have not kept up that, but in between, if you 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 keep you do a triggered MRI, a triggered MEP to see that your patient is doing okay. You can also, I did not have a D-wave monitor here, but it is ideal to put a D-wave monitor as well. But then if you are very if you are very careful with your dissection techniques, I think all these cases are doable. That's what I feel. And uh, so this was very nicely taken off. And I just wanted to show the ICG. Yes, it helps tremendously when you are not able to find out the arteries or you are confused. You take a shot of ICG, it guides you, and that's how you do the surgery. And this was the post-op we reconstructed the spine with plates and screws. And this is the post-op angio. You can see there is a small nidus remaining, I think, or maybe not. But yes, there. Are, but the patient is absolutely fine. He is now working with the. He's working with the help of minimal support, and uh, he's independent. So, I'll just finish off with this case. This is a twenty-year-old boy studying engineering. Came with an altered sensorium. The usual presentation. There was a bleed, and then. This was this AVM, and then this was this angiogram, and then this is, uh, but then you can see sometimes they're very diffuse in type and you don't know. The problem is where, where you are to start with, from which area you need to start is the biggest problem I face sometimes because they will be very diffuse on the pile surface and you really don't know where to start with. So, but then as usual, if you follow the usual technique of circumferential dissection, identifying the arteries and going, I think it helps. And then all cases are not rosy. There are also thorns. This case we operated after two weeks of his bleed, but then he had a bleed post-op as I can show you here. I'm sorry, the film is taken in a reverse way. It's on the right side. And you can see there was a massive bleed and we had to take him again the next day and do a decompressive craniotomy. And after three months, he, he became perfectly all right. We replaced the bone flap. And he wanted a picture with me thinking that uh, like uh, I am his God or something like that. They always feel that when they are all right. Otherwise, they don't care. So, but then he's back to his job. So we are also happy about it. And so this is my last slide. In, sorry. In conclusion, I would like to say the surgery remains the best option provided. It can be done. Difficult to treat surgically. Radial surgery offers some solution. Natural history of higher grades, not very well known yet. 
Embolization works as adjunct or in lower grades. Microsurgical skills, patience is very much required for AVM surgery. More randomized trials are warranted to give solutions to unanswered questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Suchendra, for an excellent talk. Uh, you have covered the topic very well. I just had a few doubts which are likely to come in the minds of uh, most of our young neurosurgeons. First of all, um, what, what, how do you tackle a, a feeding artery aneurysm? Suppose you're having a feeding artery aneurysm, which is a little remote from your avium. What would be your approach towards that? Ideally, is you, you tackle the artery aneurysm first and then you go for avium resection. So okay. uh, that, that's what you do. Suppose it's a blood uh, avium and you're having a remote uh, aneurysm which has not bled. Would you think of tackling both in the same sitting or uh, you will see if the aneurysm will subside on its own? So if it is ble bled, we anyway wait for two weeks. We can, we can go for an endovascular option for AVM for the aneurysm and you go and tackle the AVM surgically, okay. ideal way. Okay, great. Uh, it is uh, some, some, there are some people who believe that smaller aneurysms of feeding arteries may actually sometimes subside after yeah. uh, tackle a large high flow area. Now, um, suppose you get a lady um, desirous of pregnancy who has an eloquent area area, maybe a grade three area. What would be your advice towards her? Or, or what should our young neurosurgeons advise? It's a grade three eloquent yes. area, young lady, absolutely no deficits. Yes. If she bleeds, perhaps. Oh. <coughs> if she bleeds, we have no option but to go in the second. Unblend, avium in a lady who is desirous of pregnancy, but um, um, it's in an eloquent area. Would you think that we should go and tackle the avium or at the border of an eloquent area, or do you think we can um, offer an option other than surgery? Yeah, if it's an eloquent area the and she's desirous of pregnancy, then we can actually go and offer her surgery after evaluating her functionality of the area and all those things, doing all those functional and all. If not, if not, if it is in the still in the functional area and all, I mean we can give her the option saying that we can do the radio surgery, but then that does not take her away from the risk of bleeding. Okay. That's good. Thing is, uh, many of the radio surgeries may not totally eliminate the risk of bleeding. Yes. Years to come. Yeah. And um, a little bit of risk may often, often be necessary when we tackle a, yes. a lady that's pregnant. Now, um, I would just, I'd like to know what is your approach towards a post-op DSA? Do you take a post-op DSA in the immediate post-operative period or would you wait for some time? So we actually wait for some time. And so shall we uh, suggest that if, uh, if, when we, suppose you're having a residual AV, would it be yes. an advantage to go back early because there won't be any adhesions, neural yes. reflection will be simpler. Hmm? Definitely, sir. Yeah. Definitely, sir. But the logistics of my place are different. So, so that is the reason why we wait. But yes, what you say is correct. Ideally, if we do immediately, then we can again go back and tackle the rest of the thing. That's why I said in, even intraoperative MRI is useful in AVMs. Okay. Okay. Great. So, intraoperative uh, uh, DSAs may reduce our need for, uh, for tackling a postoperative. Yes. Uh, That's a yes. good good point to take. Yes. Now I know you have vast experience in epilepsy surgery also. Uh, um, a very large percentage of AVMs, maybe uh, approximately one third to half may present with a seizure. And uh, suppose there is a um, a seizure focus which is not exactly corresponding to the bed of the AVM or in close correspondence to the AVM, uh, something like a secondary epileptogenesis. Do you think we should first attempt to localize the seizures before going for tackling the AVM? 100%. We should localize the seizure before going for AVM search. Suppose you get a localization which is away from the bed of the AVM. What would be the approach you would advise? I will still do the AVM surgery hmm. and then 
again reevaluate if the shizar has come down or not because it could be the connect connections and the network which is responsible yeah the, the change in possibly the change in the uh, the micro environment the chemistry around the avia may be yes. favorable to affecting the secondary suppose we are having a mesial temporal sclerosis uh, and a parite labium so clear evidence of a secondary uh, epileptogenesis but uh, irreversible change has already taken place the patient is more concerned about the uh, the seizures rather than the avium and perhaps refuses surgery for an eloquent area avium do you think it is a it's a good idea to go and tackle the avium but the uh, the mesial temporal sclerosis before we tackle the avium i think we, if he refuses for surgery for the avium in the eloquent area we can ask him to take radio surgery and then to control his seizure control his seizure uh, i think uh, we can go for mts i'm not very sure because i would like to tackle the avium first because and then if it doesn't subside his refractoriness then probably because that's what i do for a dual lesion there's a calcification i don't do both together i just take off the lesion first and believe me 98% of the cases which i have done if you just take out the lesion it subsides so i do think that uh, we need to tackle both at the same time we can do it in a staged way but here yeah, you have put yeah. a tricky question of like he doesn't so that's i think yeah, your point is well taken your surgery, point is well yeah. yeah he will have refractory seizures so in that case probably yes yeah you the point is well taken whatever be the uh, final cause that is causing the epileptogenesis the real root reason may have to be tackled first because uh, even if you it's like the tackling the hypothalamic hematoma whatever cortical resections in hypothalamic hematoma has always failed the same philosophy may perhaps apply for the aviums so uh, thank you so much uh, sujanta for this excellent talk and for bringing the uh, concept of avian surgery to all juniors who are listening to this uh, meeting and um, uh, i think uh, a uh, significant evolution has to take place in avian surgery among the younger junior neurosurgeons there are a lot of uh, misconceptions that are there commonly there among uh, younger neurosurgeons who think that uh, embolization may be offered as an initial approach and uh, that yes. uh, maybe they are quite some considerably benign problems avian is overall avian is such an aggressive problem and embolization actually can be part of only a a planned strategy for tackling um issues yes. and cannot stand independent thank you thank you so much sujanta i think we come thank to the you, end sir. thank you thank you thank you everyone one question you, in the in yeah. the q and a box uh, prof yes. if you may look at the q and a yeah, prof, uh, on asymptomatic case grade 1 to 3 what's your advice asymptomatic yeah asymptomatic avm grade 1 to 3 the management yeah sujanta yeah i think that it's a non eloquent i will offer treatment because i don't want to leave i leave the patient with uh, with the risk of bleed at any point of time non eloquent area 1 to 3 operable go for surgery if it is an eloquent area you choose between an adjunct embolization and uh, radio surgery which fails in most of the time but otherwise a staged volume shrinking radio surgery is the today mantra for avms okay can i add a, a word actually yes, yes. Uh, a good number of the avms nowadays will be, will be found out as uh, incidental ones and perhaps the aruba trial was conducted on it i beg to differ from uh, the of the uh, suggestions of the aruba trial for a lot of reasons yes. and uh, uh, avms are really Uh, bad lesions who kill over a long long duration of time and just that small that the temporal interval in which you find it does not uh, it may look like a benign problem but over the lifetime it has a, a very bad implication particularly so uh, when you even you look at the more subtle signs of uh, avian pathology like neuropsychological dysfunction gradual multiple small body bleeds increased pressure in the surrounding 
steel phenomenon. All this thing also contributes to the ultimate pathology of the alien. And uh, uh, even if it's in the non allotment area, I think they need very allergic treatment. And uh, the, the, the findings of the Aruba trial are not widely accepted. Thank you. Thank you very much Thank to you. Uh, uh, both our speaker and chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. We move back to Professor. Uh, thank you. I'm really honored to be here today. And uh, thank you, Professor Kato, for this kind of invitation. Of course, it's a big honor to be here in between the, all those distinguished uh, guests and, and speakers and chairs as well. So, and uh, I'm really happy. So, but uh, anyway, uh, we have to start our first session. And um, my task is to, to introduce the speaker. It was, and that was already done uh, <clears throat> by. By by uh, by by um, by previous speaker. However, I also uh, uh, try to look for Professor Foneska uh, in PubMed, and I, I, I found some 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 um, research uh, papers, and especially uh, about uh, those uh, superorbital approaches. And um, that's actually the main uh, topic he's going to uh, talk to, uh, about today. And this is really a nice topic, and. Uh, and uh, the approach itself is nice, and it's using this keyhole principle, which was introduced by the Professor Pernetsky already some years ago. However, it's still uh, being used in our clinical practice, and um, and there are certain some certain indications, and uh, and I think uh, probably there are two main things uh, to talk about. This is the approach itself, and also about the indications. I'm really looking forward. To hear a very interesting uh, presentation out from the Professor Ricardo Fonseca. I'm really pleased uh, to give you the word. Thank you uh, for inviting me. Thank you for this kind inviting. I'm very delighted to be here with my colleagues from Asia. Uh, I heard that uh, the, my colleagues from Asia uh, are the most uh, hard workers, uh, neurosurgeon of the world, and very skillful neurosurgeon as well. And I'm very delighted to be here. It's an honor to be here with you. Um, I declare no competing interests. And I'm going to talk about a little bit uh, this uh, uh, in the next few minutes in the, 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 the topics. Uh, historical evolution uh, of the keyhole superorbital craniotomy. Keyhole concepts, indications, how I do it, pros and cons, and conclusions. Uh, concerning the historical evolution, uh, I'd like to say that Krauss first demonstrated superorbital, superfrontal approach on cadaver. Then, eight years uh, later, he reported the first resection of the school based meningioma through this approach. In 1913, Frazier advocated superorbital re resection, and it was uh, found useful in surgery for pituitary adenomas. And later, Bernax and colleagues popularized the keyhole concept. In the tech and the technique commonly used today, the supraorbital keyhole craniotomy. Um, actually, um, I would say that Krauss uh, first demonstrated uh, not uh, a specific uh, micro uh, keyhole supraorbital craniotomy, but a large craniotomy. And so, Pernex and colleagues popularized a keyhole concept. And more recently, Jen and Della Shaw described a supraorbital craniotomy in the approach for uh, to orbital tumors. And other variants have been proposed by Almeft and his uh, colleagues. And this slide, it's, it's interesting uh, because we can see, uh, uh, illustrate um, evolution, development of the, the uh, craniotomy in pre microsurgical area before 1960. And nowadays, uh, Kew Hentley, we can see a uh, keyhole supraorbital craniotomy. And and most of times uh, with uh, endoscopy assisted surgery as well. Regarding keyhole concepts, um, I, I would say for mainly for younger neurosurgeons that the Pernax and Rush in, in their book said that the aim of the keyhole neurosurgery is not the limited craniotomy, but the limited brain exploration and minimal brain retraction. In this way, the limited craniotomy is not the goal, but the results of the philosophy of minimum invasive neurosurgeon. 
regarding the indications and how I do it, I brought this, this very terrorist paper uh, published uh, by uh, Professor Yoko Kato and, and colleagues. Uh, it's International Expert, Expert Consensus. And I brought a specific topic uh, regarding supraorbital keyhole. And the first indication that I brought for you was uh, uh, is uh, anterior circulation artery aneurysms. Uh, in this specific topic, I brought a, a paper that I published, uh, our group published uh, two years ago. It was a paper called Comparative Study Between Minimally Invasive Supraorbital Craniotomy and Pterional Craniotomy for Treating Anterior Circulation Aneurysm in a Low Research Setting. Um, concerning our background and objectives, we know that the challenge found in performing minimally invasive approach, such as supraorbital craniotomy, in service without adequate equipment, are rarely reported in the literature. And the structural difference exists in the neurosurgery service worldwide. All we know about this issue, and for example, I, I my department is located in a region, in a poor region, in a poor region, and uh, located in a high and oh, sorry, in a low and medium income country. Uh, to the best of our knowledge, this is the first comparative study whose objective was to analyze the safety and viability of the supraorbital mini craniotomy to treat this such aneurysm. Uh, pay attention that in our department, we have a microscope, our rotom dissections, and two micro scissors and a standard clip applier. And we do not have a good drill and a neuroendoscopy and intraoperative angiography. Here uh, uh, you can see uh, a set of our instruments. It's a kit of clip applier, it's a standard clip applier, two micro scissors, and uh, one or two box of uh, dissectors, rotten dissectors. Uh, it was a ret retrospective comparative case series study evaluated qualitative and quantitative variables between pteronal group and supraorbital group from May 2013 and June 2019. We include a um, total of 85 patients and a total of 100 aneurysm clipping, uh, being uh, 40 aneurysm in the supraorbital group and 16 in the pteronal group. We included a book of rupture and unruptured cerebral aneurysms, and we exclude uh, patients who were not treated by either of the surgical uh, techniques analyzed. For example, pericalosis aneurysm, we exclude uh, posterior circulation aneurysm and giant uh, aneurysm as well. We evaluated uh, these uh, variables, operative time, angiographic year, length of intensive care, surgical complication, length of hospital stay, intraoperative aneurysm rupture, aesthetic satisfaction, and neurologic status at the charge. Um, I'm going to show you a short video uh, how can I how I do it uh, this technique. It's a, a case of um, PCOM aneurysm. It's important key points, keyhole, superior temporal line, supraorbital nerves, supratrochlear nerves. We are dissecting and dislocating frontalis muscles anteriorly. The size, the incision size is at maximum four centimeters, four or five centimeters of decision in the craniotum and no more than three and a half, four centimeters. It's important, uh, uh, it's important trick. It's drilling the, the orbital roof and the ridge, but we, we never remove the ridge. Here you can see a temporary clipping at the carotid artery. It's a small aneurysm. It's not so complex case. 
we can see a Friday aneurysm and put the permanent clipping. Checking again. Remove the temporary clipping from the carotid and the closing. It's, it's very easy craniotomy. It's easy to close. The bone reconstruction and the closure of the frontalis muscles and the final, the final aspect. Um, now I'm, go I'm gonna show you some cases. Um, it's an example of ACOM, aneurysm, pre-op and post-op. And a case of PCOM and ACOM, uh, just to illustrate that it's possible you clip in uh, multiple aneurysm in the, the same approach, through the same mini uh, keyhole approach. It's another case, ACOM and PCOM, pre and post -op. And here you can see some aesthetic results in elderly patients. And now uh, I'm going to show you some results of our paper. Um, we, we couldn't see any difference in the groups and sex and topography and intraoperative rupture, any difference. In cases of aneurysm rupture and a rupture, no difference. But we found a difference between mailing in operative time. Operative time, we found a difference, statistical difference, significance, and time in ICU average. Actually, when we analyze the specific time in ICU, ever, uh, uh, in ICU uh, when we exclude patients with surgical or clinical complication during the hospitalization, we, we can't see any difference anymore. Regarding the, the aesthetic results, we can see a uh, uh, difference between pteronal group and supraorbital group. Uh, uh, we use a, a visual scale, analogic scale. We found a difference, significant difference. Regarding uh, out Glasgow outcome scale, we didn't see any difference between these two groups. In concluding uh, our paper, we can see that supraorbital mini craniotomy uh, technique is a safe and effective as pteronal approach for treating anterior circulation cerebral aneurysm. Supraorbital was shown to be feasible in general neurosurgical service with limited research using the same surgical set. Uh, that we use in vascular microsurgeries. Uh, with supraorbital craniotomy, uh, there were benefits regarding surgical time and aesthetic results, meaning mailing, and was equivalent to pteronal group in the other parameters evaluated. In our paper, uh, ACOM and PCOM artery aneurysm are the most appropriate for the, this minimally invasive technique. Any we recommend this minimally invasive technique be applied by surgeons who already have experience in traditional vascular microsurgeon and in select case. It's very important to select the, the case. And we hope that these results encourage other surgeons around the world in service with limited research to develop this technique. Um, following the indications, um, remember that the 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 international expert consensus, I brought another indication that we used to do is a uh, tumor, uh, mailing in anterior school-based tumor. As I mentioned before, uh, I asked myself, what would be the best approach for our patients with school-based tumors as a cell tumors, for example, in a low research setting? Uh, for example, we do not have endoscopy. What would be the best approach? Uh, so I was surprised uh, when I went to search PubMed, I surprised, uh, uh, realized that various uh, uh, authors had asked the same questions and they uh, uh, found similar, uh, similar conclusions, similar results than ours. For example, in this paper published in 2014, the authors conclude that supraorbital had better outcome in terms of operative time and length of hospital stay. Estimate blood loss, headache improvement than endoscopy. Uh, of course, of course that this paper was published in almost uh, about 10 years ago. And we know that 
endoscopy had increasing the, the, the results. And of course, I'm not saying that the keyhole uh, supraorbital is the technique of choice for the, the anterior uh, fossa uh, surgery. I'm, I'm just saying that in this, the case that we do not have endoscopy available, we can, we may use uh, as an alternative approach a uh, keyhole supraorbital craniotomy. And here is just to show you another, another uh, uh, papers uh, with similar conclusion. And here you can see this paper published of our, about four years ago. And the authors conclude that supraorbital keyhole approach using the eyebrow incision is safe, effective, and both treatable and convenient for treated lesions in the arterial fossa and cellular region. Here, similar conclusions in this paper uh, published four, uh, uh, six years ago and almost about nine years ago, similar, similar conclusions. So I'm gonna show you a um, case. Uh, uh, it, she was a, a 36 year old, a female uh, headache and visual impairment with uh, prolactin normal. Uh, as you can see here, um, campimetry pre-op, and she was, she was uh, about blind. And now uh, we can see a CT scan with a, a cellar tumor and supracellar uh, impairment. And here we can see a MRI of the same lesion. And now I'm gonna show you um, a short video that how I can do it, the same approach. Is it exactly the same? Again, it's very important to drill in the orbital roof and very important drainage the cerebral spinal fluid. I would say that is the most important uh, moment is the drainage of the cerebral spinal fluid. Now you can see the, the optical nerve and the carotid artery on the left, in the middle light, we can see the tumor with a cyst component. And now we are coagulating and remove the tumor. Just to remember, we use uh, exactly the same uh, set of uh, instruments that we use in the stern, in standard craniotomy. There is no difference because we do not have available adapted uh, instruments and angulated instruments. Um, we don't have a, a, a available um, specific instruments uh, for this, such of this approach. Use a simple curette, angulated curette. You can see it on the carotid artery on the right after the decompression. In the similar closures, rec bone reconstruction. Okay. In the, the first uh, post-operative day, uh, the CT scan, uh, the result, and the, the very nice aspect. And here we can see a campimetry pre-op and post-op. And the patient uh, evaluated very well. He, uh, she recovered uh, her camp, uh, visual uh, field. And here we can see uh, her aesthetic result. Uh, 
very nice. And now I'm I'm about concluding. Um, I would humbly uh, suggest two more uh, indication pathologies uh, for this approach. Um, the first one could be uh, an example of epidural empyema that we can we can do the same is the exactly the same approach. Here is the pre-op and the post-op. Is very nice aspect. And another case of uh, epidural empyema as a complication of frontal sinusitis, we can see a collection of pus and gas, and this the frontal sinus occupied by pus. And we proceed the same uh, approach with a good result. And the second indication that I I could um, I could uh, recommend it's in selected case as I mentioned before, is a traumatic epidural hematoma. So, uh, pre and, and post-op. And so, I'm about concluding, I would say uh, that PROS from uh, keyhole supraorbital craniotomy, uh, its approach is a less surgical, uh, surgical time, faster post-op recovery, minimal cerebral retraction, less exposure of brain tissue, few complication is a controversial topic, and aesthetic satisfaction is a very important uh, result. And cons, I would say that it depends on uh, mailing learning curve. Uh, mailing in vascular neurosurgery is very important. And we can remember that it, I, you are working in a narrow surgical corridor and few, you have few research when complicating and you pay attention uh, with one problems. Uh, mainly eyelid, edema, paresis, and diseases. Concluding, uh, keyhole supraorbital craniotomy is a simple uh, execution craniotomy. Many diseases can be treated, uh, uh, as I, I mentioned it before. Orbital roof resection not required in most cases. In my personal experience, I I never needed to uh, to uh, I never need to to require to roof resection and minimal tissue damage requires learning proof. In case of microsurgery, it's most important learning proof. In few alternatives in the face of interoperative complications and careful selection of patients is the most important topic. Thank you very much for inviting and thank you again. Thank you, Professor. May I, may I invite a Professor Austin to chair the discussion. Yes, uh, thank you for a very nice talk and lecture. It was really interesting uh, not to see just overall review of this approach itself uh, and uh, also to see your personal results, uh, interesting videos and um, how you have selected uh, the patients with different kind of pathologies and also <clears throat> how you have a um, uh, acquired uh, the results of your approach and uh, you, have you done uh, the estimation of the results of this approach? Uh, maybe just for uh, uh, for the discussion, uh, may, may may I ask you some questions, please? Uh, just uh, just um, uh, since this is like educational um, um, uh, event, uh, you know, uh, uh, probably uh, uh, the appropriate question would be. Uh, when to start uh, to do such a, an approach and which would be, let's say, the first pathology to start with? How do you think, in your opinion, of course? When I indication this approach? I mean, uh, uh, you know, when you are resident, so when to start the approach? When, when, ah, when, you, okay. are ready, when, you, when you are ready to start the approach and which would be okay. the best, uh, best indication to start with? Um, at, the, at the third, at the third, year to fourth year of training, uh, we select case and for this, this approach and they start training. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very common approach in our department. But uh, the question is, when we proceed, uh, I think that the, 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 the message uh, from, for the, the young neurosurgeon, uh, when you indicated in our department, we indicated in very st strict case 
in the case of cerebral aneurysm, we, we operate in non-acute phase. It's important to say that. And to be honest, it's not on our account. It's, it's due to, uh, we don't have available angiography in acute phase. So we must wait, unfortunately. So uh, we can, we, we, we have to wait in the non-acute phase. And of course, the, the, the cerebral is most comfortable to, for this specific approach. So the ResNet is, uh, uh, is more comfortable for, for uh, this, this, this approach in, in the aneurysm, for example. Okay. Okay. So then, um, maybe maybe uh, one more question would be um, uh, regarding uh, the aesthetic result of the surgery itself. How, how is it actually in the Brazil? Uh, let's say you showed some examples of the women. Are they more happy with the eyebrow approach or with a classical optimal approach? You know, because you know it's very important question if we talk about the ladies, especially. Yes. Yes, I agree with you definitely. Uh, when we uh, include our patient, and when we uh, search, search our results, we show the patients a case of pteronal scar and a, a, a case of iolide uh, wound uh, results. And the patient can compare and decide, for example, and, and, and she can uh, decide, oh, I prefer this one. If, uh, because uh, we we know that the atrophy, temporal atrophy in the uh, pteronal classic approach, it's quite common. It's quite common, and we never seen pteron uh, temporal muscle atrophy in supraorbital approach. We never seen, of course, because we do not mobilize the temporal muscle, so we can see any atrophy in the muscle in the temporal muscle. So most of case. Uh, even the, the, the women uh, like it. Even the, the women uh, 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 evaluated uh, very uh, satisfied. Uh, yes. And um, actually, uh, maybe from your personal view, uh, you know, sometimes uh, when you do this, this uh, eyebrow incision with a, a keyhole craniotomy, actually you end up with a uh, big swelling and periorbital hematoma. Maybe you have some kind of personal trick or sort of... Uh, uh, you know, how you handle the situation just to get rid of this periorbital hematoma, which can sometimes uh, um, arise on the next day after the surgery. Yes, yeah, it's quite, quite common in our personal experience, this hematoma. And I try to, uh, I ask to my, uh, um, my, uh, my assistant, when we, we put um, compress, uh, over the, the eye line and to compress at the next days, three days, compress with the, the, the um, um, how can I say that? A, a, a band to compress and just above the, the ridge uh, for three days about. And, but uh, the, the important to say that the hematoma is it will disappear in the, the, the next days. It always disappears in seven days, five days, seven days, and 10 days, at maximum 15 days, it will disappear. But um, I, the, 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 I personally use that the, a, a compressive um, band uh, in supraorbital ridge for a few days, but uh, it's not always working. It's not always working. The time, the time is the better. The time is the better. Okay. Uh, and maybe one more question from me. I just, uh, you ended up your presentation with a few uh, sort of clinical examples uh, when you showed uh, the removal of uh, epidural abscess and also the epidural hematoma through the cyber approach. And at least for me, it looked like slightly slightly controversial. Maybe you can, can, uh, can comment on this. And uh, um, since 
probably I, I wouldn't prefer to go uh, for those pathologies through the eyebrow approach, but uh, maybe what were, you, were your considerations regarding those pathologies? I agree. I agree. And I know that is a very controversial topic. That's why the reason that I brought to you <laughs> to discuss. Uh, but uh, uh, again, I, 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 I always tell for my residents that it's important to select the patients. Uh, most of the time, I do not operate such of epidural hematoma in patients, in common patients, or if, or if the patient has epidural and subdural, for example, hematoma in the safe CT scan, of course, I, I do not recommend. It's, I recommend in cell, very, very selected case, in patients in good conditions, and, uh, and the epidural hematoma, for example, uh, uh, just located in the, 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 the frontal lobe, just above to, uh, uh, above to the, the, the orbital roof, and patients in good condition, and patients not in coma, and patients with uh, 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 in that had a, a head trauma in not in, in a higher uh, uh, synaptic uh, uh, energy. So I uh, uh, again in select cases, mm -hmm. okay. it's not a we we do not use in in trauma brain injury. You will not use in in spread <laughs> situations. Of course, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. See, and maybe one, one small final question, um, if you allow me. So uh, actually, do you also have some trick how to properly close a dura? Because sometimes it's also pretty tricky, and especially if it's. Uh, you know, uh, not a young patient, so and the place is very restricted. And um, how you manage this situation? Um, we do not have any trouble with uh, dura closure um, in, in young people. Uh, in 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 elderly patients, sometimes it's happen uh, 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 difficult situations. You use some um, uh, a patch from. Tissue, a soft tissue patch, and uh, and glue, some glue, and we never seen uh, 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 spinal spinal cerebral spinal fluid le uh, uh, leaked. We never seen, mm -hmm. and and never seen infection as well. Okay. okay. Now, as I can see, there is one question coming out from. Uh, from the panelists, am I right? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Ben or Dr. Ayman, yes. you want to ask a question? Yeah, maybe yeah, I thank just... You. Thank you, Professor, yes. Yes, uh, Dr. Ayman. Ahead, yes, yes, please. Thank you, Professor Ricardo. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Ricardo, for this informative uh, lecture presentation, especially that it's a low sitting uh, country like our country. I have a uh, low sitting country like our country. It is, a, I think it is one of the uh, magnificent approach. Sorry, I, I, I couldn't. Uh, I have uh, some I, question. I, about... Can you hear me well or not? Yeah, but it's 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 interrupting some some. Uh, uh, I have some technical question about the approach itself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you chafe the the, the eye pro or not? There is chafing or no chafing? Do, do you use the gravity for uh, for pre and retraction gravity? Do you do, do you use the, the head? Do you make the head more to the down for gravity? Yes. The are you are you asking about the, the head position? Yes, head position and chiefing. Do yes. you chief in, in, in the hair or no? Yes, yes. I I I'm, I recommend all all of the time, all of the situation to my residents pay attention to elevate and the the and we work with the gravity favorable. We do not use any Drain uh, spinal, uh, sp uh, cerebral spinal fluid, uh, lumbar, lumbar drainage. We never use, is not, for in our personal experience, is not necessary. We, 
we uh, drain the cisterns, uh, cerebral spinal, and open the cisterns and drain the, the cerebral spinal fluid. And we work Thank you. with the gravity, yeah. of yeah. course. Do you use loops, loops, or or just microscope? Can you do you do you have any experience with loops in this approach? Or, no, uh, I have no experience with loops. Uh, only microscope. We have we have a good microscope. It's it's yeah. all that we have of good instruments. It's a very nice microscope. But the rest of the instruments is very <laughs> complicated instruments. But Fortunately, we have a very nice microscope. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Hello. 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 Yes. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, Dr. Ben from Hong Kong. So I, I would like to add uh, 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 your presentation about the use of the endoscope. I come from a uh, tertiary center in Hong Kong. Uh, mainly specializing in uh, using the endoscope for the transorbital surgery. So our, in our series, we, we think that using the endoscope for the transorbital, for those um, uh, orbital and uh, stellar, uh, orbital and also middle force lesion, also in the temporal force lesion, we, the, the duration of stay and the blood loss is uh, much less and we achieved a good cosmetic result. And just now we discussed about the incision of the eyes. Uh, concerning the eyes, so we have we work with our um, uh, ophthalmologists and uh, the oculoplastic colleagues. Uh, so we we're talking about um, we have a uh, eye need. We have uh, also subbrow approach, uh, liquid approach, and also even transconjunctival approach for those uh, eye incision. I think uh, one of the tips and one of the importance uh, to stress is about. Uh, uh, maybe we could invite our oculoplastic colleagues uh, to help us uh, with those uh, 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 incision if needed. So, and uh, also I would like to congratulate Professor on your case, really great cases. I agree with you that um, this uh, approach that uh, we try to be minimally invasive and I also have experience in this approach during my uh, training and uh, but not to the extent of of you doing those uh, compact muscular lesion. So just uh, my question um, to you is about, I saw you have some uh, doing uh, some uh, uh, infection cases. So my concern is about because the, um, the first thing is about the CSF leak and also how would you repair the frontal sinus? And the second is, second question concerning those frontal sinus is about the, the drainage. Do you need to, Asked the uh, ENT colleagues for um, uh, to drink uh, to drink it um, before or during your operation to uh, get the drainage done before uh, because it uh, otherwise it might recur again for the for those uh, 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 infection cases. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for the question. Uh, the first question you asked is about the frontal sinus invasive. Yes, how, how, how would you repair the frontal sinus during your... Okay, uh, we heard that uh, when you search the literature uh, and some authors uh, don't recommend uh, this, this approach when we uh, realize that the big frontal sinus. In our personal experience, this is not a contraindication. We, we do proceed the same, the same way. However, we... When I uh, when we close the the, the craniotomy, we put um, uh, argument in the frontal sinus to close it. That's mm -hmm. that's all, and we never seen uh, an infection in the 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 case that we mentioned it. Uh, we operate in that paper uh, eighty five patients or 30, 35 in the the supraorbital group, and we never seen any case of infection uh, conditions and 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 we never seen any uh service spinal fluid uh week yes how about do you uh, need to get the drainage like doing fast with ent before the before your procedure sorry do, do, do you need to get your ent colleagues 
to do the drainage of the frontal sinus first before you proceed to the uh, quinotum. No. We, we, unfortunately, we do not have uh, any NET colleagues available in our department. I see, I see. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you. That, that's, we, work, that's... we work sometimes in hard conditions. <laughs> yes, agree. Yeah. Same, same in bad place. conditions, sometimes. Yeah. Bad. But yeah. it's important because we we need to superate our difficulties. And it's, it's a daily challenge. Yes, yes. Thank you. That's Thank the you. end of my talk. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Professor Ricardo. Uh, for really Thank you. For hear the concluding uh, uh, remark from Professor Auslan. Professor? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, I think uh, that was really... Uh, very fruitful uh, period of the discussions. Uh, so as you can saw, so there were many questions and also there actually we received really nice answers. And uh, for sure that um, I think uh, there is a place for this type of approach. Uh, and uh, as we already agreed previously, there are some certain indications and the base, actually the main thing is about the patient selection. So you have to yes. select the proper approach for the uh, proper pathology and um, and of course the execution is just uh, on you so you have to spend uh, some time to learn the anatomy so you have to spend some 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 cases to increase your capacity to perform such an approaches and uh, uh, just um, for some certain pathologies which are especially located around the anterior uh, and um, uh, skull by area actually this is really a nice uh, approach uh, which could be uh, can you use in your daily practice? So I, I personally also like this approach and uh, I will really like, uh, recommend it uh, to use it. But of course, uh, for the beginning, you have to learn the basics and as a next step, you know, then you can proceed already with more sophisticated uh, approaches. So I think it was a really great talk, Professor um, von, uh, von Seca. So, and thank you very much. And uh, thank you. Thank you for a kind invite. It was a, a, a honor to be here with us. Thank you. Thank you uh, to both speaker and our chair. Uh, and we are reaching the end of the today webinar session. On behalf of the Education Committee of the SNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, uh, I would like to thank uh, both speaker of today, Professor Ricardo Francesca and Professor Suchandra uh, Bhattachati, and also the chair, Professor Casper uh, Oslan and Professor Matthew Abraham, for the time and support for the SNS webinar. I also would like to express my sincere gratitude to Professor Zubin for broadcasting this webinar on WeChat channel. And special thanks to my co-host, Dr. Ben, for joining us today. So until we meet uh, again tomorrow, it's bye-bye from all of us. Thank you, Professor.